Uh, so once you, because I know that your first attempt of Everest was an interesting one. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so post Denali, I then, I then decided on Everest and um, again, paid the deposit, which was, as is often the case, a really good, you know, way to commit to something. If you paid, I don't know, a thousand pound deposit, um, then it sort of just goes, okay, this is a, this is a line in the sand and this is your deadline and you can work towards that. And then I just spent many, many months and hundreds of emails and letters and phone calls uh, to try and get a sponsorship, which was um, just a really demoralizing process. I learned an enormous about, amount and I look back now and I'm slightly cringing about how I did it, or mainly in terms of my own naivety, I'd say, rather than my methods. It was just, we had no idea what we were doing. I had a friend who was helping me a lot. Um, but eventually we got there just, I think, through sheer perseverance, really, um, and then ended up on Everest. And I was 20 and I had done big expeditions, but not really big expeditions, not so two month expeditions, which is what Everest was. I think I found that uh, quite hard. I was still young, I think mentally still quite young. Um, anyway, we then fast forward the climb was going okay i wasn't super strong but i was competent i was confident as well in my own ability to summit and then i got a really bad throat infection at base camp before a summit attempt um so i was struggling to breathe had a really bad voice anyway we got to high camp um i was struggling to eat much at this point uh i'd had a half pack of jelly babies or something but pretty much not much for a couple of days and was was pretty ill in terms of my breathing and had taken a bit of time set off for the summit. And then it was, as you say, interesting. Um, and it's one of those where you go, it was sort of a perfect, um, not literally the weather was perfect, which is one of those ironies, but it was a perfect storm in terms of situations, uh, that all emerged at the same time. So, you know, first of all, my, my head torch cut out, um, batteries, weren't happy with the cold spare battery didn't work so I was sort of fumbling around in the dark and free climbing up without a rope and you know things like that and relying on moonlight which again it seemed fine at the time you know just plowing on but actually on the north face of Everest that's that's a pretty rash thing to do when you can't see properly and then I had three incidents really back to back one was uh, a teammate well, the sh Sherpa at the bottom of the uh, first step got incredibly altitude sick. He had summited twice before, but very altitude sick and was throwing photos of his family off the mountain um, saying he was going to die. And it required, and he didn't, re he didn't want the oxygen we gave him. Um, he refused it because he wanted to you know, die in peace, um, which was, <laughs> there's not much we could do about it. And it required another Sherpa to come behind him and, and literally punch him in the face. Um you know, full, full sort of Mike Tyson style and floor him and then wake him up and say, right, you're coming down on me. So uh, Keith and I carried on going. Keith then, uh, he, he sort of asked me whether it was cloudy outside and whether we should descend. It was perfect blue skies. So his eyesight had frozen over, his corneas had started to freeze, so he descended. I then fast forwarded, came across uh, another teammate at the base of the second step who was incredibly altitude sick, um, blocking the route. And he couldn't really remember who he was, where he was, what his name was, how to put on his rucksack. So we had to put that on for him. So yeah, just chaos really. And then got to the top of the second step and came across another teammate who had run out of oxygen. Um, uh, and so I gave him one of mine and spoke with him for a bit until someone else could take him down and then carried on going and then got to the stage where I had to turn around. Um, I saw a, a teammate descending, spoke to him and basically realised that I didn't have time in my view to safely summit and come back down again. Um, so I was probably 150 metres from the top, um, which is about two and a half hours, um, which is not very far. But I, I think... I, I was very tired, certainly, but I basically concluded that I couldn't, I, I still think I would have summited. I think I would have just blindly and blinkered 
in my perspective, would have continued on going and summited. I just was by myself and I was now 21 years old and I'm pretty confident I would have had a proper drama on the way down. So I turned around and then, yeah, had an epic descent and lived to tell the tale, but didn't didn't have the summit photo I wanted. Yeah, because I imagine I, I it's a difficult one when you have put so much time and effort into you know training for these huge expeditions and finance as well and then to be 150 meters away and sort of feel like it's not your fault i mean when you came back did you feel was there a feeling of giving up or did it just sort of make you slightly more determined i think to be honest i was a bit melancholic when I got back I just um I'd lost a lot of weight I was physically pretty drained mentally pretty drained I mean a a very very intense experience um you know to have and one of the guys who I saw the one who was talking to his rucksack ended up just off the route um just off the route and was lucky to survive my other teammate who I descended with fell in a crevasse I had seen you know, several bodies on the route. And, you know, I was very young and it's, it was, a, I think, quite a lot um, to take on board, actually. And within a week of that day, I was, you know, back at Heathrow Airport. And I, I think that was a, an odd transition. And I think I spent a lot of time trying to come to terms with what had happened, really. I don't mean the actual events themselves and what I'd seen and done, but partly that, it was partly the amount of energy, as you said, and effort that I'd expended to trying to get to that stage. And then you have to basically realize that what I did was the right thing to do. And that's a big transition. And I spoke to a lot of teammates about uh, our own experiences on the whole expedition, why other people hadn't summited, and specifically why I didn't summit. And you know, sometimes when you're young and gung ho and macho, you just think you can sort of rule the world and every and the puzzle pieces all go into place and all will be well. And I think I struggled with that transition when it sort of didn't go according to the plan I'd set myself. But I think that's when I sort of required friends and uh, the wisdom of people older than me to to give me insights, basically, as to whether I'd made the right choice. And I found immense reassurance in that to basically then accept the fact that in reality, I'd done the right thing. In hindsight, if I was in the same position again, I would have made the same decision and it was the right thing to do in terms of my own safety, really. So, you know, again, I think back now and I go, you know, as a 20-year-old kid, there's, there's bodies on that mountain who basically have exactly the same dilemma and don't do the same thing and even the following day there was a guy who I knew at base camp who almost had exactly the same dilemma I had almost to the letter and he carried on going summited died on the way down when his eyes he got um, cerebral edema the following year when I summited there was another story of a guy who summited late died on the way down with bad eyesight and cerebral edema. There's a body I passed with a young Canadian climber who tried to do it without oxygen, summited, died on the way down because he summited too late, got cerebral edema. And I think when you suddenly have context of all of these, you go, I'm grateful I turned around and didn't become a statistic. 